So far this semester, we have focused on scientists whose marginalized identities have been related to race, gender, and disability. Over the next two weeks, we're going to focus on another marginalized group in STEM, those from the LGBTQIA community. This acronym stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer or Questioning, Intersex, Asexual, and Other Gender and Sexual Identity Minorities. <sighs> That's quite a mouthful. One of the first things to recognize in this discussion is that the acronym LGBTQIA is really an umbrella category that encompasses a ton of different identities, and no acronym will ever catch them all. Many folks within the community just use LGBT, knowing that we mean more than just lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Much like we heard doctors Thompson and Quave discuss about the disability community, which includes a huge range of types of people, from those with mobility impairments, to those with mental health issues, to those with vision or hearing loss, to those with cognitive or social disabilities. Similarly, there are lots of different identities that fall under this big umbrella of LGBTQIA+. I, for instance, identify as a cis gay man. Cis is the counterpart to trans, where trans refers to people whose genetic or biological sex don't align with the societal exp expectations for their gender. Cis refers to those of us whose biological sex and gender do match social expectations. Cis and trans are two expressions of gender identity, an intrinsic identity, one that's just about oneself. Other, pe other people may be non-binary and don't fit into the socially constructed categories of male or female, or they may be gender fluid, shifting between traditional gender roles throughout their lives, or many other manifestations of gender. Intersex is a related intrinsic identity, applying to folks whose biological and physiological characteristics don't neatly fit within the traditional male and female categories. Gay is a descriptor of my sexual identity. It's a relational identity about the way in which my gender is related to the gender of those I'm sexually and romantically attracted to. Gay is the most commonly used term by male identifying people who are attracted to other male identifying folks. And among female identifying folks, lesbian or gay are both pretty commonly used. Bisexual, pansexual, and asexual are also sexual relational identities. Queer, the Q of the big acronym, is kind of a catch-all adjective that can apply to any of these gender or sexual minority categories. Historically, it was an if it was an offensive word, and still can be used offensively, but it has largely been reclaimed by the LGBT community, as have many other words that were at one time highly derogatory. Please be careful when you're using these words. Like other words that have been reclaimed by stigmatized groups, these can sometimes be offensive when used by those outside the, the identity group. Speaking of words, one of the things I'm often asked about when I speak about gender and sexual identity to those outside the LGBT, LGBT community is, how should I refer to LGBT people? Perhaps uh, it's easiest to start with things not to say. The word homosexual is not commonly used anymore. It has a clinical, sterile, medicalized connotation. It's usually best to say gay, bi, or lesbian if you're referring to someone's sexuality. And when referring to gender identity, it is not generally okay to use the word transsexual. That word blurs the distinction between intrinsic gender identity with relational sexual identity. We also avoid transgendered, which implies some sort of thing that's done to a person. We use transgender or just trans when referring to non-cis gender identity. The ways in which stigmatization and marginalization impact each of these communities is distinct. Cis white gay men 
have many forms of privilege that trans black lesbians do not, for instance. But there are a few common threads. For the most part, the characteristics that make us LGBTQIA plus are invisible, or at least fairly easy to cover up. This might be hard or contrary to what makes us feel like ourselves, but in general it is possible to pass as a part of the majority community. This places gender and sexual minorities in a unique place. Historically, the work of LGBT scientists and STEM professionals wasn't marginalized any more than the work of other scientists of the same race and gender, but their identities were hidden. These scientists were forced by their colleagues and the prevailing social norms to divorce their personal lives from their professional and scientific lives. Can you imagine how it might impact your professional work if you were constantly afraid of having a part of your identity discovered? How would that impact your state of mind, your creativity, your motivation to work? Often, when a, when a sexual or gender minority was outed in the workplace, they were subject to harassment, firing, social ostracization, or in many cases, criminal prosecution, because their identities were actually explicitly illegal. And in many parts of the world, being queer is still illegal. Today, many LGBTQIA scientists and STEM professionals still feel that invisibility and the lack of representation is a massive barrier to full inclusion in their work. Personally, as a kid going through school in the 90s and finishing graduate school in 2013, I didn't have a single openly LGBT teacher or professor through my entire education. I mean, I knew a few faculty members at my undergrad and graduate institutions, but I didn't have them for classes. And those that I knew in graduate school were deeply closeted at work. As far as I know, I have been the first openly gay chemistry faculty member at both of the institutions I've worked at. And I'm a cis white male from a relatively affluent background who benefited from the privileges associated with those identities. The lack of visible representation contributes to a leaky pipeline for LGBT scientists just as it does for women and other marginalized groups. Of course, there are many other things that contribute to marginalization of LGBT individuals in STEM, and we can talk much more about these topics in our classes over the upcoming two weeks.